Morena Mateo. Okay, we're back. We're live with uh, Transitional Justice here on a given Monday morning at nine o'clock. And we're, and we're talking to Maria Moreno Mantilla. Uh, she is a Colombian and she is in Germany working uh, on hmm, International Criminal Court uh, of Justice Matters. Uh, and we're going to talk to her today about uh, a change, if you will, a new step in, in the uh, ICC's uh, involvement with um, the war crimes in Colombia. Uh, so good morning, Maria. Hi, Jay, and good morning to you. Good evening from Germany. <laughs> That's right. It's, what is it? Oh, my gosh. It, it must be nine o'clock there, eh? It is. Uh, okay. So thank you for joining us. Uh, let, let's talk about um, the background a little bit before we get to the uh, appointment of a new, uh, uh, a new council, so to speak. Uh, so the first, the first question is, uh, you know, FARC um, was the agreement, the, the peace agreement around FARC was a real positive thing uh, in Colombia. Uh, uh, and for a while it worked, but then it didn't work. Can you describe the, you know, the dynamic on that? Of course. So indeed, as you mentioned, there was a peace agreement. It, it was signed in 2016 between the Colombian government and, and then the FARC or the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. This agreement was, of course, a milestone and it is something historical, in my opinion, because uh, it agreed that the parties agreed, the parties to the conflict agreed that they would seek these venues for reparation to redress the wrongdoings that were committed in relation to the conflict. Of course, also as part of this agreement, they agreed to establish the special jurisdiction for peace, which is the current transitional justice mechanism that is in place in Colombia. So of course, it is, it is a very, very relevant agreement. And of course, the institution that it created is paramount and it, is, uh, it, is, it gives hope to all of us uh, for the redress of these wrongdoings. As you mentioned, it has had rather a bumpy start, I would say. Because of course the institution was created as such, the legal framework was agreed, it was agreed, was also approved domestically. But then with the current administration, it has faced different challenges. And of course, as you mentioned as well, then you have other international actors, for example, the International Criminal Court, which are monitoring the situation in, in the country. Well, now for, for reasons uh, that we probably should discuss at least a little, the um, the, the president of Colombia has not requested assistance um, to some of the problems. And I guess the problems are ongoing and that people are still in the streets after what, almost six months of disturbances in the streets. Um, and there are violations of uh, human rights going on in Colombia. Uh, and he could, he could request assistance from the uh, Criminal Court of Justice uh, in Holland, in in, uh, in the Netherlands, but he hasn't done that. Uh, do you know why he hasn't done that? Uh, wouldn't that be a good idea? That is correct. So indeed, uh, the national strike uh, was started in April this year. So we're at more or less three, four months of national strike of demonstrations and protests on the street. Um, I must also say that the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court opened the preliminary examination into the situation of Colombia in 2004. However, this preliminary examination is focusing more on war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in, connect, in connection to, to the conflict. So in principle, the current demonstrations, the current human rights violations would not be covered, let's say, by the scope of analysis that the Office of the Prosecutor is carrying out. As you, as you rightly say, the government has not requested assistance from the International Criminal Court. Um, this preliminary examination, it was, it was opened upon or under Article 15 of the Rama Statute. And that means basically that the Office of the Prosecutor received a series of communications which were informing of different human rights violations, crimes against humanity, war crimes. It is, we, we still have to see whether civil society in Colombia, civil society organizations are still referring information concerning the, the demonstrations and the protests. If they are sending this information to the office of the prosecutor for it to possibly then include it into its analysis under the preliminary examination. Although- so are, are you saying that the office of the prosecutor could take action even if not requested by the president of Colombia? That is correct. So under Article 15 and Article 53 of the Rama Statute, the Office of the Prosecutor is entitled 
to assess whether a situation meets the legal requirements for the, for the ICC, for the court to exercise jurisdiction on the field. This means that there are certain ways in which the Office of the Prosecutor can receive information. So as I have referred, Article 15 establishes that the, the, um, the prosecution, the Office of the Prosecutor, can receive then information regarding these human rights violations. It could also be a state referral as it has happened in other situations, or it could be a referral by the United Nations Security Council. In the case of Colombia, we're talking about Article 15 communication. So information reports, et cetera, that have been referred then mostly by civil society and organizations. So um, the, the news then is that, that a prosecutor is uh now in place or will be in place what is the what is the news about the icc's action uh on the basis of these various requests yes yeah, so uh, there we have uh, we have a new icc prosecutor this is the third icc prosecutor that was elected icc prosecutors have a term of nine years the first one was Luis moreno campo the second one was fatu ben suda her last day of office or in office was a uh, 15th of june this year and then the new prosecutor, Mr. Karim Khan, and he was sworn into office on the 16th of June this year. Mm -hmm. However, there was a, a new development, as you have pointed out, and is that on the 15th of June, so the last day of in, in office for, for Prosecutor Ben Suda, he released a benchmarking consultation in connection to the preliminary examination in Colombia, which shall be taken up here by, by the new prosecutor. So when you say the new prosecutor for the ICC, you mean the chief prosecutor. Uh, the right. prosecutor is not uh, an associate of one particular area or country or set of crimes, but all the crimes that the ICC looks into. Am I right? That's correct. So the Office of the Prosecutor is one organ within the International Criminal Court. And then the Office of the Prosecutor is led or guided, as you have pointed out, by the chief prosecutor of the ICC. There is also a deputy prosecutor that might be changed, we will see. Uh, right now is Mr. James Stewart, a British, I think it's a British na national. So uh, right now we have uh, Mr. Karim Khan as the newest uh, recently elected chief prosecutor. So we, we styled this, uh, this discussion, uh, uh, lucky the third time, this would be the, the third prosecutor, but why did, why did the first prosecutor and the second prosecutor not do anything with respect to Colombia? So they did. They did, in my opinion, what they could. The thing is that the first ICC prosecutor decided to open this preliminary examination, which now is 17 years old. So we're talking about the longest preliminary examination that the Office of the Prosecutor has carried out. Then in 2012, the second prosecutor, Mrs. Fatou ben Suda, took office. Then what she did is that she released an interim report in which she tried to assess the situation of Colombia and then decided or tried to determine whether the preliminary examination should remain open or if a decision rather to close it should be taken. In this case, then in this interim report, what the Office of the Prosecutor did is that it tried to narrow down what were exactly the phenomena that the Office of the Prosecutor were looking into. So as we have mentioned, the OTP is looking into war crimes and crimes against humanity. However, in this interim report, there were four particular phenomena that the Office of the Prosecutor highlighted as particularly relevant. So we're talking about sexual violence, we're talking about paramilitary violence, we're talking about forced displacement, and we're talking about false positive cases. Back then, the prosecutor decided to continue with the preliminary examination. And then in 2019, Mrs. Fatou she stated that it was part of her strategy to make or to, to take determinations, the, to decide on, on the preliminary examinations before she left office. And this was the case, for example, in the case of in, in the situation of Nigeria or the situation of Iraq and the, and the UK, in which a determination was made. Now, this benchmarking consultation basically means that the OTP seems to be still at crossroads. And what it's trying to do is that it's trying to to get, to get further information from stakeholders to create a, like a benchmark framework that might assist then the OTP to reach such a determination. That's why we're now, at the, this is the challenge that the third ICC prosecutor is gonna be facing and we will see whether third time is the lucky time. 
You know, uh, now I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Colombia is a relatively civilized country in, in Latin America. It has uh, arguably um, a democracy, a, a functioning government. Um, it doesn't have a lot of um, what you hear about in the American immigration crucible, the people running for their lives um, because they and their families will be mm, persecuted by the gangs and the like, um, I, I guess. And, uh, and it has people like you who can speak, who can speak their minds, who can participate in the work of the ICC. Um, that is something. And I, you know, although it's it's good to have uh, this office of the prosecutor um, spend a little time with you and attention with you, there are so many other places in the world where the atrocities, the war crimes are so much more stark, more frightening, more, more, more worse. And um, why isn't there a priorities problem here? Um, is, is it that the office of the prosecutor is, is or should be more interested in countries and regions uh, in which war crimes are, are more are more savage? So this statement about Colombia is still debatable. Of course, we can say that Colombia is a civilized country. We have a democratic government. However, we had a conflict that, that spawned for more than 60, 65 years. And even though with the peace agreement, hostilities seem to cease, there are still some episodes of violence in the country. So who's for doing it? Who's doing it, Maria? We have different parties to the conflict. We're talking about paramilitary groups. We're talking about FARC dissidences. We're still talking about state forces. So there are still, and for example, criminal bands, which are still engaging in hostilities and still engaging in committing crimes, international crimes against civilian population. So of course, there are different situations around, around the globe that may uh, may call for the attention of the of the ICC. However, the ICC in any case has, and particularly the Office of the Prosecutor has determined that these crimes that are being committed, that were committed and that are still being committed in the country are grave enough for the ICC to have jurisdiction. So right now, the element that the OTP is assessing is admissibility. And for this admissibility test, one element that it is considering is where the domestic proceedings that are being taking place in the country are genuine. So that's why, in my opinion, this is why the OTP is once again at crossroads, because of course the, the ICC is not supposed to be subsidiary or the, it is not supposed to just completely take over all the, the judicial processes and whatnot that are taking in place in a country. What it is supposed to do is more to be complementary to these domestic uh, judicial system, systems. And why are we talking that it is at crossroads? Because of course there are still domestic judicial processes that are taking place, as I said, and with the special jurisdiction for peace, there is clearly the ability and also the willingness from the, from the state to carry out these prosecutions domestically. However, the result, that is a different thing. We're talking then about whether the, the real commanders or the ones who actually, the, the most responsible as a proper term in ICL would be, are being prosecuted or not. And this is where the OTP has signaled that in some cases, it's, that seems not to be the case. So that's why we're still talking about the preliminary examination and we will see what, uh, what will be the result of this benchmarking consultation. Oh, you know, but you, you have a, a, a functioning government. Why doesn't the government attend to this? <clears throat> why doesn't the uh, Colombian prosecutor system address these problems um, and, uh, and arrest people and prosecute them and put them in jail and stamp this out internally within the country? Um, and if it isn't doing that, what is wrong with it? Um, and how can the International Court of uh, Criminal Justice and the, and the prosecutor um, change that? So um, the office of the, of the attorney or the attorney general's office, it is indeed carrying out certain uh, domestic processes in the jury, ordinary jurisdiction that are aiming to prosecute these in international crimes. Then we have different system of institutions, like for example, the special jurisdiction for peace. We also have another transitional justice mechanism, the justice um, of peace, and, uh, per, sorry, the law of justice and peace. 
And, and then a new system of institutions were also set in place to prosecute these uh, international crimes. The issue is that according to the Rome Statute, in order to prosecute core international crimes, it, the most responsible ones must be prosecuted. So right now, the domestic proceedings, these, these proceedings that are being carried out at the national level, seem to be prosecuting mostly middle and lower level perpetrators. So they are still not looking fully into those most responsible ones. And because of that, we cannot be talking about full redress of these wrongdoings. And then the obligation of the state under the Rome Statute is still yet to be fulfilled. So is the Office of the Prosecutor actively uh, investigating these crimes now, actively consulting with the government on, on having them prosecuted, um, or is it still ramping up? So the Office of the Prosecutor, the first prosecutor, Mr. Luis Moreno Campo, he came up with this concept of positive complementarity. So as I have mentioned, the Rome Statute establishes that the ICC must be complementary to domestic jurisdictions. But then this concept, this, this, this notion of positive complementarity establishes that the ICC and particularly the OTP can monitor how the domestic proceedings are taking place at the national level to assess whether they are in fact genuine. So this is something that the OTP continues to do. But as I said, I mean, the state does seem to be willing and able to carry out these proceedings. But then we have a series of, of elements that have to be considered, for example, the outcome. Really, the most responsible ones are really those most responsible ones being prosecutor. Are, are they, this, then we cannot really talk about you know, full reparations or full guarantee of non-repetition, non truth, justice. So there is a big justice gap still that, uh, that has to be fulfilled. And I think that, that that's what the OTP is seeking. The kingpins, the ones at the top, uh, exactly. exactly. Are they? Are they? Are they like like the FARC? Uh, are they still involved in drugs? So the drug trafficking might still be a component, but I think that in this case we're mostly talking about, uh, for example, the commanders of the state army, the state forces. Mm -hmm. But then we're also talking about paramilitary groups and the potential involvement of politicians and this political elite and class in the country and the relationship that they have had in fostering the activity of these paramilitary groups. And of course, then the role that they have taken in, in these hostilities and in this violence that has been ramping in the country. This, this, is, um, this is a direct threat to the democracy in Colombia. This, this kind of uh, atrocity, this kind of war crime goes directly to civil order um, and uh, would undermine the government if it isn't contained. Uh, this, is th this would be very troublesome. How, do, how does this compare against similar processes in, in Central America and South America, Latin America in, in general? Are there countries that are experiencing the same thing? Uh, what are they doing? Is it better? Is it worse? Does it involve the uh, uh, international court criminal justice? So there have been, in fact, other countries in Latin America that in which the civil society then has tried or has engaged with the office of the prosecutor. So we're talking, for example, um, of Mexico. We're talking about Honduras. We're talking as well about Venezuela. So in the case of Honduras, there was a preliminary examination that the Office of the Prosecutor initially opened. And then upon an assessment of the legal requirements, it determined that there were no, that, that, yeah, that, that no crimes under the jurisdiction of the court were being committed, that there was no reasonable basis to believe that these crimes were being committed in, in this country. Reasonable basis would be then the burden of proof that the Office of the Prosecutor has to assess. Then we also have, for example, in, in the situation of Mexico, the civil society keeps on referring information under Article 15 for several, several communications to the Office of the Prosecutor. And the Office of the Prosecutor has not opened a preliminary examination. It has determined that in the situation of Mexico, it is at one phase that would be called phase zero or phase one, which is a, a secret phase of the assessment that the Office of the Prosecutor carries out but then the preliminary examination has not been announced as open. And then we have the situation of, in Venezuela in which currently there are two preliminary examinations. One opened according to, to under Article 15, 
uh, since the Office of the Prosecutor received a series of communications in this regard. And then a second one that was open due to the state referral of government in, of the government of President Maduro. Is the United States involved? The United States has always had a close relationship with Colombia. There are a lot of American retirees in Colombia. Uh, Colombia, you know, business includes a lot of American companies. Um, is the United States involved? Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, when, when we had this issue, when we are having this issue about the assassination of the president of Haiti, uh, the FBI goes down there. Um, is the United States involved in Colombia? The United States is indeed involved in Colombia. In my opinion, it is not as involved in the situation between or the relationship between Colombia and the ICC. Of course, there is also the question of whether paramilitary violence and paramilitary groups had been mainly or possibly financed by uh, American companies. So, although this is something that has been analyzed and that is, is currently being assessed by ordinary jurisdiction in, in Colombia. This is not something that the Office of the Prosecutor has referred to. However, the United States is not a state party to the Ram statute and then the Office of the Prosecutor would have certain issues establishing jurisdiction over nationals of the, of the US, for example. Very important for stability and stability is very important in Latin America. Uh, but we don't have stability in many, many countries in Latin America. And in a way, uh, Colombia is a kind of special, sui generis in the legal term, in its own category, I think. And so it becomes all the more important to um, preserve order, uh, preserve democracy, such as it is in, in Colombia. So um, now you're in Germany. You, you've been in Germany for a number of years. You took your international law degree in Germany. Uh, why are you interested in all of this? Why are you associated with Project Expedite Justice? Um, why are you in involved? Well, I am involved because, uh, as you have mentioned, this is part of my, of my legal training. I am a Colombian lawyer. I studied international law. I specialize in international criminal law and human rights. Um, as a Colombian lawyer, I think that we have a responsibility to just disseminate as well this kind of information to properly in understand what, it, what are the in international institutions doing when it comes to the country. So for example, in the case of Colombia, the ICC has had an impact that it's all symbolic. So when it comes to politics, very often as part of this democracy and as part of politics and how they how they involve in them in the country, the ICC has been used as a token. So then I think that it, the more that we communicate about what is currently happening, the more that we explain to normal people what is actually happening, what is the assessment that the Office of the Prosecutor is carrying out, then the more tools that we're given to them to properly understand what is the impact of these international institutions and why international law and particularly international criminal law is important and should be also upheld also domestically. Yeah, so a part of the mission is to build up the ICC, um, the International Court of Criminal Justice, which is not actually part of the United Nations, as I remember. Uh, it's on its own um, and it, it needs to have support from what do I call it, member countries uh, and it needs to have um, successes. It needs to be able to go and make things better in a given client country, so to speak. So <clears throat> you know, with, with your training and your mm, familiar, familiar, uh, feeling familiarity with all that is going on, what exactly do you do? You mentioned before the show, that you do research. And uh, I'm not sure if that's legal research or evidentiary research. Can you talk to us about that? Of course. So uh, as, uh, as I was mentioning to you before we went live, I, I am currently working um, at a foundation NGO here in, in Nuremberg, and we're doing legal research. We're doing interdisciplinary research. Currently, I am working on a project on digital evidence. But I am also affiliated with another NGO, the is a case matrix network. And then what we do is capacity building and strengthening of the domestic authorities. So then they, can, they have the tools to prosecute core international crimes domestically. So it is more like this idea of positive complementarity, how to properly make it practical. So it actually takes place like this. And then the ICC has to be less involved in these situations. So let's assume that your research includes 
evidence. Mm -hmm. Digital evidence is everywhere these days. Um, <clears throat> digital evidence is very persuasive. I mean, look at all the uh, examples of that in the United States. I mean, the insurrection is is um, is reflected in miles of digital evidence. Um, and so, I mean, would um, <clears throat> would um, you know the killing of uh, George Floyd have been as much a, a spectacular public uh, interest and concern had it not been recorded on digital evidence. So it seems to me that's one of your best uh, tools in the, in the kit, in the inventory. And the question is, um, uh, what are the challenges of getting it? What are the challenges are, uh, are, of, it, are of presenting it? Um, and when, when you do present it, where does it go? <laughs> does it go to a decision by the uh, prosecutor? by the court? Does it go to uh, a trial of guilt or innocence? Does it go to punishment? Or does it go to all those things? Can you talk to us about the, um, the importance of digital evidence and, and how it is used? Of course, so as you mentioned, digital evidence has taken more responsibility, more sorry, more relevance in the last years as technology continues to, prog to progress. So as you also mentioned, we have seen more videos, for example, on YouTube or on Facebook or tweets and, and whatnot that might refer then to core international crimes. The challenges uh, relate to how to properly take these digital materials and then turn them into evidence. Then we would be uh, talking about different kind of frameworks. So for example, when it comes to the civil law framework, then we have different understanding of how these pieces of evidence should be treated. Then there, we have also different uh, kind of frameworks and regulations when it comes to common law systems. At the international level, what the, and particularly the, um, the research that we're doing is that we're trying to compile these practices from different legal systems. So then we can properly assess how should this be done by international uh, tribunals. But as you said, the, the challenges are, are massive. They, they mostly relate to verification, authentication, how to guarantee that a certain piece of evidence can be relied on, uh, how can they be corroborated, and then of course when you submit it to the judges, how to submit it to, uh, in order to avoid potential biases, because for example when we're, when we're talking about user-generated evidence, if we're talking about this evidence that has been, it's been captured in a protest, then most likely this evidence will be captured by the protesters and then they're going to be recording, for example, a state of uses. But then we don't see the other side of the coin, if you, if you wish, because then they, it depends how the, this type of evidence is collected. So then as well, how to properly analyze it so we can guarantee that as part of the assessment of this evidence, we can, we can reach the truth, which is ultimately, or at least this legal truth, which is ultimately what we try to reach when it comes to yeah, to judicial processes. So in these uh, war crimes and atrocity proceedings uh, before the, uh, the uh, International Court of Criminal Justice, um, who presents that? In what circumstances? Uh, how is it used to achieve some judicial result? So evidence can be, can be submitted by either of the parties, either the Office of the Prosecutor of the Defense, uh, when it comes to digital evidence, that was a case, Albert Fali, the Albert Fali case, which was a, in which the ICC, the International Criminal Court, then the, it reached a determination and decision in, on the uh, arrest warrant, and it was mostly focusing on seven Facebook videos. Of course, there were other pieces of evidence that kind of corroborated what was seen on these videos, but then that was, uh, that was yeah, heavily debated in the international criminal law field of how then how can then we properly assess these these videos how can we properly guarantee that they are authentic how can we verify them and and so on but as i said this is something that it is still the, prog the progress is ongoing and what we're trying to do is how to pro provide proper guidelines to international justice institutions so then we can have more legal certainty about uh, about these processes yeah so you mentioned that uh, at some point uh, somebody charged with a, a war crime or an atrocity could be arrested. <clears throat> do you, do, does the court have the power of arresting someone anywhere in the world? And when they are arrested, what happens to them? 
And are they defended? You know, just as there are a number of lawyers who help the prosecution, I would imagine there are lawyers who specialize in defending the, the people who are accused. Can you talk about the process? Of course, of course. So when it comes to the procedure of the, um, the ICC, then we're talking about different procedural stages. So we have already referred to the preliminary examination stage. This is not a judicial, judicial stage as such. It's more a quasi-jurisdictional stage, if you, if you wish. Um, and it is carried out then before the office of the prosecutor. But at this stage, there are no judges involved. Only if the office of the prosecutor decides, or for example, it determines, that there is a reasonable basis to be to believe that crimes under the jurisdiction of the court have been committed in a certain situation, it might then request to open an investigation, request for authorization to open an investigation before the pretrial chamber. And then we're talking about the judicial stages. Then we're talking about the pretrial chamber, for example, then we're talking about the arrest warrant, then we have the confirmation of charges, then we have the trial phase. There is one thing that is important to, to know and, and to mention, and is that the ICC is, it is an independent institution. It has a relationship with the UN. However, it has no police force. So it cannot, it doesn't have like any kind of law enforcement organ that can go on the field and then seek these, these suspects. What it can do is that it relies on the cooperation of state parties under part nine of the Rome statute. And then based on this cooperation, it expects that then these suspects are properly apprehended and then taken before the court in The Hague in the Netherlands. Once this happens, then of course the defense counsel is assigned. The, office, the International Criminal Court has a list, well, first of all, it has an organ such, the Office of, of Public Defense Counsel. Um, and that is, that is, um, that is the organ that then kind of coordinates what kind of de defense and legal aid is then provided to the suspect. Because of course, it also tries to uphold the human rights of the suspects. Mm -hmm. Sure, fair is fair. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'd like to ask you also, where, where is this going? Um, <clears throat> is the uh, Criminal Court of Justice, International Criminal Court of Justice, getting better traction these days? Does it have more work? Do you have more work? Are there more atrocities, more war crimes now than there were, say, 10 years ago? Um, wh where is it all going? Is this mechanism that you've been involved in that we've been talking about effective in the face of whatever the level of atrocities and war crimes are in the world today? Or do we need to do something to uh, give it more traction? Your question is very sensitive because next year is going to be the 20th anniversary of the, of the establishment of the court. So there have been several debates about what is the record right, of the court to date in the last 20 years. So in, in my opinion, I think that right now, of course, I mean, unfortunately, atrocities are still being committed everywhere around the world. There, there is plenty of work for the ICC and unfortunately not enough support. So uh, for example, the, pe the previous administration in the US was particularly strong against the ICC, and it even imposed a series of sanctions against the then prosecutor and then some, some heads of units within the office of the prosecutor. This is also, this is also coupled with some, some states that have stated as well that they would like to withdraw from, from their membership, let's say, from the, from the court. So we have, we, we're facing a situation in which atrocities are still being committed, budgetary constraints remain, they remain the case, um, and then there is not enough support from state parties and from other states in, in the international community to guarantee that the ICC can, can continue its mandate. And I think that this is also one of the challenges that the new ICC prosecutor will be facing. And just as in, the, in civil law in, in continental Europe, the prosecutor is a very important member of the team, perhaps more important, um, you know, in the context of the Interna International Court of Criminal Justice uh, than he or she would be in the United States um, uh, prosecutorial process. So, okay, Maria, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, issues in funding. Well, who supports the court? Where does that money come from? Is it, is it the members who have signed on 
Is it others? And has the United States supported it? So the budget is approved by the Assembly of State Parties. The Assembly of State Parties has a meeting or a session um, once per year. Of course, last year was a bit more complicated because of the current pandemic. Um, however, they still need, they still have to approve uh, the budget. And it, this, also, this also has a relationship with how much the, the Office of the Prosecutor and different organs, the registrar, for example, as well, is, says that they need in order to continue their, um, their function. They also have received some kind of the, some donations. And to my understanding, the US has provided some donations, but not in the last years. The relationship between the US and the ICC has been rather bumpy, as you can imagine. Well, I'm, you know, I think that um, Donald J. Trump was doing war crimes. Uh, you think of the uh, the children penned up um, uh, inappropriately uh, when they crossed the border a few years ago. Uh, my own view that that was a war crime um, and uh, other atrocities. And so the United States is in a funny position, isn't it? It's not a member. Um, <clears throat> it does have some problems. Um, and yet people expect it to be the leader of the free world. Uh, I think it would be better if the United States was a member and cleaned its own house and, and did not elect President Trump again either. That's my view. Um, but the, que the, the question I put to you is, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't the International Court of Criminal Justice have more traction uh, if it were formally associated with the United Nations? Okay, so if I if I make a, if I may make a comment about about what you referred to regarding the, the Trump administration, so indeed, for example, these these facts, these these incidents could could amount to core international crimes. The thing is that we have uh, we have a dilemma, let's say, when it comes to international justice, and it is that the international community is still very much based on the principle of sovereignty of the state. So considering that the U.S. is not a state party to the ICC, then the ICC would really have some trouble in establishing jurisdiction because it would require then territorial jurisdiction and of course personal jurisdiction among others. And because of this of this non-membership, and in that note, on that note, I, I may say as well that uh, President Clinton actually signed the Rome Statute, but then it was not approved, it was not ratified by the US Congress um, at the time. So there has been some kind of willingness to be to interact, to be part of the of the court, but then it has not been completely uh, crystallized. As to the question regarding the relationship between the UN and the ICC, the point is that the it, when the the founders, let's say, of the of the International Criminal Court, the uh, delegations at the Rome Conference in 1998, they wanted to create and establish a, an international institution, an international ju judicial institution that would be independent. So it is under this, this principle that the ICC, although has a relationship with the UN, it is not one of the organs of the UN and it cannot be considered to be dependent on it. So it does not have um, any, as the Office of the Prosecutor has stated as well in the past, it aims to not be political. It only applies the legal framework that it is established and that it should apply. Now that you said that, it sounds quite right. It sounds like the best arrangement um, because the United Nations has become political, uh, particularly the Security Council, and uh, it, it, it's best if, if the ICC stay away from that. Yeah, that's very. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, at the same time, of course, uh, there is one thing is what is on paper, and one thing, another thing is what is the reality, right? So on paper, of course, it is an independent institution and it tries, I do believe so, to not, not to be political as much as it can. But of course, it is an international institution that it is playing on the international field and it cannot completely be blind to, to the political interactions that, that happen there. So for example, you have had the situation in Palestine or for example, the situation in Ukraine or the situation in Iraq in which some concerns about how politicized or not certain determinations by the office have been. And as I said, the office of the prosecutor insists once and again that all the all determinations that it has made are non-political. So it is only a legal assessment of the legal requirements, but I think that this reality cannot be completely overlooked. Wow, great. 
Wow, what a great discussion. Well, thank you, Maria. Uh, we have to circle back and and uh, you know get get updates from you on these and other issues uh, around the International Court of Criminal Justice and its work and about mm, Europe in general. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Moreno Mantia. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Aloha. Aloha.